Having been around esports for 15 years, I can say that I think CSGO right now has the best broadcast talent, so casters, hosts, analysis guys, of any esports game I've ever seen in history and as a result also at the present with all the major games that we've got going on. Admittedly, I say that with the caveat. First of all, I am a member of the broadcast talent of CSGO. And secondly, <clears throat> I'm not sure I would know these people to the same degree or in as much depth if I hadn't been a part of these desks and worked with them and therefore got to see how fantastic they are. So people who are big fans of the other games and just desperate to believe they're all amazing in the other games will probably just think to themselves, well, if he'd been part of League of Legends, he'd say that there, et cetera, et cetera. But I know a lot of the people in the other games, I've watched all these games, and I think even just the, the product that you get on the camera, I think is the best in all of esports and in history. I mean, admittedly, obviously, streams and VODs weren't as big a thing a decade ago. So the problems I see are best outlined in the other games that don't exist in Counter-Strike. And that's that's an initial thing I want to make the point of. It's not just the talent of the people, it's also some of these circumstantial or industry issues. So in StarCraft 2, this is a game where, first of all, I think we suffer in StarCraft 2 from the fact that Koreans have been the best players essentially forever, and we have no real access to the minds of the really good Korean commentators. There's a guys I know came from OGN, guys like that engine guy etc who when we've seen translated parts of their casting some of it seems fantastic and the knowledge and the depth seems amazing and their understanding of the metagame and how it's developed and what people are thinking seems very very advanced but unfortunately we don't really have access to them so we can only really comment on the western players whereas obviously in games like csgo it's not as big a deal everyone who's a relevant caster speaks english and we can hear them all <clears throat> so in starcraft 2 i have to say despite not having access to these korean casters I think StarCraft 2, one of its big strengths is it has a lot of good analysts. It has a lot of people who mostly were put in the color commentary role because analysis on desks didn't really become a thing until sort of like 2013, 2014. But from desks as well, I've seen they've got some people who are fantastic there. Unfortunately, I feel like most of them, with the exception of someone like Artosis, who obviously works in Korea working for GSL, I think a lot of them have had issues, though, especially in the first two or three years of StarCraft II, with showing obvious bias, both in their own opinions and the way that they did their casting and their analysis for the Western players. We're talking about the foreign players, the player, in fact, yeah, just foreign players in StarCraft II, because anyone who's not Korean, right? you need to be Chinese and they'll hype you up. But the way they would talk about certain players you really would think that, like, Huck was going to win GSL. You would think it was possible. Not Artosis when he talks about that, but the way they would talk about him in other competitions. And so I felt like, unfortunately, I understand the nature of why that might happen and why it doesn't happen in a game at CSGO. The same natural bias isn't there and wouldn't, wouldn't naturally arise. But it did sour me a little bit because it's such fantastic analysis, but then it's like you're tempering that and bringing it back a bit by putting in this silly pantomime about how the Western players are so good and the foreigners can do it and all this sort of thing. I especially think in StarCraft 2, the biggest mistake was there was way too much emphasis on hype. And for the first, say, two, two and a half years especially, almost every commentator who was a play-by-play -play went way too far with the hype aspect. And what happened is he got addicted. It's like they say with comedians, okay? Sometimes there are comedians who are like, all right, comedians. And then the reason why they actually start to steal material from other people is they get addicted to the feeling of killing. When you say a really funny joke and everyone laughs, they get addicted to that feeling. So in the same sense, I feel like what happened is when you have a fantastic moment that's truly exciting and you're really getting into it, it's a great battle between two players. It's so tense and exciting. And what could happen now? It is so fantastic for you anyway, but then also the crowd reaction they're getting and you're part of a moment and this is incredible. I think unfortunately a lot of those casters, especially the ones who were early in their careers, got addicted to that feeling. They tried to create it, tried to artificially enforce it on moments that didn't really warrant it. And as a result, I feel like it burned you out a little bit when you watched the game. And also, unfortunately, due to the way StarCraft works, where an individual game is one unit and there's no measurement of score, essentially, you can be leading early on, but then you can lose later. And also, because if you lead, you can gain more leads and more leads and more leads. And where that doesn't really work in CSGO, because obviously, even if you're up 12 to 6, at some point, the other guy gets full money again. And in theory, if he's the better team, he could now win every round and win... 16, 12. So we don't have the same game biases towards building up one person being stronger and having an overwhelming chance of winning. And so unfortunately in StarCraft 2, this hype casting coupled with the nature of the way the game works and the way advantages build up, unfortunately meant that there were also a lot of scenarios where someone might have a really big lead, like a pretty much an almost insurmountable lead, unless they both make an insane mistake and the other guy makes an insane play. And sometimes impossible even if the other guy makes an insane play. And I would hear casters still do fake hype 
uh, essentially the end of the game. Like the game's basically over. The economy's fucked. The other guy's he got way too small an army. He's got the wrong unit composition. There's no way he can win this fight. And believe it or not, for the first two or three years of StarCraft Two. They would literally cast it like the guy would be coming in to destroy his last base. This guy would be down to some like workers and a couple of units. And the guy, the commentator would be going, he must hold. Can he, surely, can he possibly hold this off? Like, no, he can't. No one thinks he can. Anyone with a level of analysis and deep understanding of the game, or basic understanding of the army compositions and strengths, knows this can't be done. And so the way you're casting it is ridiculous in that fashion. And so, again, that's another thing that soured me a bit to that game. I also think once you move past analysis and the general commentary style, they had terrible non-existent banter and personality in StarCraft 2. In the latter days, they've brought it on a bit. People like Todd can obviously banter a bit, but they had a real lack of actual personality. I mean, the only one I can think of is maybe in control. They, they really struggled for people who were actually funny and could vibe with people and could make jokes and could make a game entertaining to talk about that hadn't been entertaining as a game in the sense of adding some showmanship, some entertainment factor, daring to say some funny or exciting things. They really didn't have any of those. And so unfortunately, I felt like in StarCraft 2, it was basically just a game where there was a lot of analysis talent, but as a result, because of the lack of personality defining them, it felt like there was like three or four elite color commentators who were all reasonably similar depending on region, they might have differences. And then overall, most of the talent was in, in a fairly similar narrow set of values as to how you describe them and their strengths. Oh, and League of Legends, <clears throat> first and foremost, I will give League of Legends a massive pass in as much as it is one of the hardest games to analyze because the game itself, due to the patches, is changing all the time, quite radically. The regions have their own meta games that are developing based on these new changes and picks, etc. Then you have to add in the way the composition works to affect the game. So you might be seeing compositions you've never seen before against a composition that you think you know, but you haven't seen all entirely the way they're going to play it. Then you've got to add in all the players involved in this scenario. It's an incredibly hard game to analyze. And as a result, I don't think it's actually possible to be a true world expert to the degree you could in a game like CSGO, where it's possible you could watch every top team in every big game. There's also the fact that, unfortunately, Riot does, because they control that game with a tyrannical iron fist, or red fist, as it were, they, because ironically, they let it go to rust. They exert a massive influence on esports. And so for their tournaments, Worlds, MSI, and, the, and LCS, etc., it's more restrictive. As in, even what you th even if you can have banter, you get into this riot bubble and this matrix where you wouldn't even think to make what would be considered like body banter on another desk or in another game like CSGO, but would be considered so outrageous and scandalous that you wouldn't even think to do that. Therefore, you're always within these narrow parameters. So <clears throat> the big problem I have with their personality banter there is they have some personalities and some interesting guys, but the banter feels a lot more staged. Not necessarily in, in terms of it's actually scripted, although sometimes they do cue each other in, more in the terms of it feels like it's definitely on rails and it can't really go anywhere outside of this safe area, you know. Their idea is to have Jurassic Park, but the, the dinosaurs never break out and you just go past and go, ooh, look at that T-Rex, don't go too close, children. Like, I can't feel overall, my feeling about League of Legends, the tournaments I'm talking about from Riot, etc., is it's too produced for my liking. In a sense of, I don't, I, I very rarely ever found producers who actually could tell talent what to do better than the talent who were really, really good guys would know themselves. And so it felt a bit too produced for me. I will say, League of Legends has some fantastic color commentators. I mean, Deficio, Monte Cristo, these are obvious examples. Guys who put in a lot of work, who've developed their own style, and just give you fantastic information all the time. And on to some degree on a more wider scale than some of the other games because they're feeding in the patch information how this has changed and how this champion's changed and how in the champion pool of this player he's changed it and how they picked it like they're just giving you all this information it's all really rich it's really fantastic so they've got some really good talent over there some really good color commentators particularly unfortunately this is probably the worst game of all time for bias towards western players i mean nowadays it's not as overt because to get their credit some of the big famous Western casters you're thinking of have learned you have to at least study China a bit or you have to say that the Koreans are going to win it. But the bias in how they cast it, especially for those first few seasons of LCS, was ridiculous. And then moving on has been a little bit underwhelming because I expect the guy, the guys who are supposed to be the best analysts in the game and the analytical broadcast talent, they should be the guys who acknowledge who the absolute best are and are constantly making clear to the casual viewer that there is a separation between the best and the guys who are below the best. They're never supposed to be blurring that line because that's not their job. If you want to do, let someone do some bullshit hype, let the fucking play-by-play -play guy do that and then you correct him or you, you give your own perspective separately and you don't buy into that because it's just not a way to do it. 
I don't really care if any if little fans are like that's that, that's how casting has to work. I've done casting, mate, and I've been involved around this whole scene for years, and I've watched real sports where you don't have to do that. So, Dota Two is a game that I actually think has fantastic spec value. I think this is a game that actually, in terms of talent, is really sick for the commentators. Like they have fantastic play by play. They have really good color commentators as well. I think in terms of analysis analytical talent they have really really good analytical talent and they may they might actually have overall in terms of like not not like depth but in terms of uh no, not not breadth but in terms of depth like each analytical talent who's really good i think they might have the best in all of esports like they have some fantastic knowledge there but unfortunately a lot of it's a bit dry and it, and there are too many guys in the analytical talent especially on analysis desks who to me are like the same person with the same sort of thoughts and so it's like their desks are they go down a desk of people and these people just take their turn to each address the same question there's not like a dividing up of the tasks like we've got in csgo there's not as much good pass off there's not people disagreeing on a really fundamental level who are the really good analysts in my opinion now, I will say, part of the reason I think their analysis is the best is because they have the best ex-pro players who are analysts. They have some unbelievable guys there. And unfortunately, some of them go back into casting and all sorts of things, so you, you kind of lose them for a while, but they are fantastic in that sense. I also feel like Dota 2 also lacks personality and banter, actually. I think this is a game that it actually has less than League of Legends in that sense. And unfortunately, I feel like part of that's because they're all scared of Valve and not being invited to majors and to the international. Now, that, that's not the way that majors work in CSGO. Valve, in theory, it's their major, but they, they farm it out to a third-party company who makes the tournament, and they invite someone like me. So I don't have to be worried about what Valve thinks or whatever. In fact, Valve never communicates to me on that level. But unfortunately, the people in Dota 2, I've talked to some of them, and I've just seen it outright. Some of them are just scared, to, even the ones who could show personality, to show personality. And a lot of the ones who are the really good analysts just don't have a lot of personality from being for it. I do think there's a little bit of bias in terms of the Western teams in this in Dota 2, and I think that's not just because they're obviously not casting the Chinese stream or whatever. I also think it's because, unfortunately, a lot of them are quite close friends with the pro players in the Western scene, and that combined with the Valve thing, which already makes people scared to criticize, I feel like it's made a lot of the Dota 2 people afraid to properly criticize players, and they feel like when they have a team like Complexity, they have to hype them up in some ridiculous fashion when that team's not going to accomplish anything internationally, you know. Now, <coughs> I have to add in also for something like Dota 2 that I think that's a game that unfortunately that Valve restriction probably means it can't develop too much more in terms of casting I don't see how people overcome that like I don't see how they get people in there who are gonna put a cat among the pigeons for example and make it more interesting because they've already got everything else they just need to put the show aspect with it. it's like that great thing out of the prestige right where they're talking about uh it's the, the two magicians who are the battling ones and the one who's uh, Christian Bale his magic's way better he's a way better technician and a way better ma magi like a magician but the difference is the other guy has the showmanship and so the other guy's actually being more popular because he has the showmanship knows how to translate to the audience knows how to create suspense how to make it exciting how to make it funny this guy doesn't know that so if they added that in I think Dota 2 could be the best it certainly could, could, could tie CSGO it could certainly be up there Admittedly, they've got some restrictions that will stop them. Now, the key thing about CSGO is that we don't have any natural bias. Like, I think if you watch the streams, except for when people have explicitly told you, you would not actually know which of the players, the pro players, the casters are friends with. I mean, I actually know myself. I know some of them hate someone or they really like someone, and I've watched them cast, and I'm amazed by how unbiased they are and how they actually just treat everyone similarly. Now, part of that's because we don't have vibes sitting over our shoulder or Riot Games. We don't have people producing us in the same sense. I also think what makes the analysis especially good in CSGO <clears throat> and commentary in general is that in theory, all the top guys can watch all the top teams in all the top matches because the way our circuit operates in fact we don't have asia fully activated yet now we i think we have a great mix of good like technical ability in terms of the casting we have really good analysis we have admittedly we don't get as much time as dota 2 do that's one thing i'll say i think dota 2 has the also part reason they have amazing analysis they have amazing amount of time on those desks and for the pick ban we have really good analysis I think we have the most excitement, the best humor and banter. No one can fuck with us for humor and banter. And a part of this is because not only is it just talent of natural people and developing a system, but we have the least restriction. We don't have anyone producing us or telling us what to do or how to talk. Or anything. I've never, ever had production in that way. Or if I have, I've explained them why I'm not going to do it that way. And also, as a result, we can create an environment where the talent's like, leave us to manage that shit. You run the cameras, you run all this stuff. You tell us where to go and we'll figure out the show. And so I think when you let people who are talented do what they want to do, you're going to get the best results rather than trying to micromanage them. 
I also think as a crucial detail compared to any other game, we can actually criticize the game itself when it's broken or unbalanced or fucked. Now, StarCraft 2, they're scared of Blizzard. Not, not just for StarCraft 2, the game, but some of them might want to work in Heroes of the Storm or some other game, Overwatch. In Delta 2, they want invites, so you're not going to massively criticize the game to the same degree. <clears throat> and in League of Legends, they are just Riot's bitch. That's not even worth going into detail on that one. They just lived in completely Riot, under Riot Storm the whole time. And you see what happens when you try and criticize Riot, like with Monty. So I also think uh, from being around a lot of the other games as well, because I've been to events now where some of the other games have been there, and I've actually, as a friend, gone to see people at League of Legends, etc. There's not the same infighting or petty rivalries in CSGO as other casting groups in other games that I've seen. I think the green rooms in CSGO are amazing. We are so having so much fun in those green rooms. I mean, admittedly, it's because it's the people who I'm going to talk about now, and we're all, we all know each other. But what's, what's good is because we set the tone early, especially in the era of like 2015 onwards, people like me and Richard, when we got in there, we set this tone early that it was going to be raw, it was going to be uncensored, it was going to be fun in those green rooms, and that's a way to let off steam and to enjoy yourself and have some fun. And then you, you're you watching the games, and then you go out, and then you do the, the professional aspect, which still has some banter, but it's reined in within a certain level of what's reasonable for a broadcast. I mean, Gfinity's Angels, when they came up with that tagline, when Scoots, me and Richard, did, the, did those tournaments... I mean, people said initially, it's like the top gear of CSGO. That really is kind of the vibe that we've brought to those green rooms and then certain desks one as well. Now, I'm going to give some thoughts on the different casting broadcast talent in CSGO and how I see them. And I'm mainly going to talk about the guys I've worked with a lot and that I've watched a lot. I'm not going to go into absolutely everyone. There's not enough space. So first of all, I'll put me and Richard as a package because obviously we were the package for a while where he wouldn't work until ESL until they took me back, which I appreciate. And... Obviously, we developed this banter style, the Top Gear style, and we were on so many desks together. Some desks, he was the host, DreamHacks in 2015. Some desks, we were both the analysts, Gfinity, etc. Obviously, we've been on majors together. Inclusion of Poker, he was actually the host for that one. Uh, I think he, let me think, oh, he was actually an analyst for MLG Columbus. We've done a bunch of majors together. Now, I think of me and Richard, and the reason I'm but putting us together initially as well is because in terms of attitude and demeanor, I would describe us as like the oasis of CSGO. If you know the the, the rock band Oasis who came around, they first came kind of to, to note in like 1994 in the UK with the Britpop movement, <clears throat> they're loud, they're brash, it's like they know they're the best. Like if you, you know, it's like, come on, you can't, let's have it. It's like, if you think you, you're as good as if you think you can fuck with us, then come at us. And like, we're going to come at you basically. That's kind of our, our vibe when we do analysis and when we do broadcast shit. So it's, it's real fucking rock and roll. That's, that's like the approach we've got. So, you know what? We're British. If you've got a problem with that, shove it up your ass, fuck right off. I mean, it's mainly like the Oasis vibe, but we take some of that kind of attitude and that swagger and demeanor into how we do our broadcast. And we're not afraid to criticize players or to make a joke or to, or to banter with each other and fuck with each other a little bit. And we got to keep it fun, but it's definitely with that kind of like a slightly dangerous vibe. I mean, in terms of individual skills, obviously we have different skill sets. Like Richard tends to build up player narratives and talk about the context of where that player was and where he is now and where we think he's going. He does a good job in that particular aspect and he mixes in stories from from himself knowing these players and, and the history of the players, especially the source ones. Myself, my main approach is the historical context. I like to set up a match of where these two teams are heading at the moment, what they've done in terms of their, their recent results, what they've changed in terms of players, etc., where their trajectory is. And then obviously I've now more recently specialized in pick band phase where I think I'm the only person who truly studies that on an in-depth level and tries to do interviews figure out the psychology of the players to know what they're actually going to pick and ban and so I tried to make that a, a key point and in doing so I've been able to manage desks by I give up some of my room for analysis to other people or I built or I set them up in exchange I get some of the pick ban so it's also not a thing where because I'm like a tier one talent I just take time from other people no we try to manage it out we try to put the right person for the right job which is something they don't do in some of those other games <clears throat> now, Anders and Samler are obviously a famous duo. <clears throat> What's funny is when D-Man made some comment, I think it was in an AMA, about Anders and Semler, I think he was on the point, actually, which is that he essentially said that they're like hybrid. They're like half color and half play-by-play, -play, each of them. And I actually agree. I think that's what makes their duo extremely rare throughout the history of esports. But I would say it's not purely half and half. It is hybrid, but to me, when they're at their best, Anders is two-thirds play-by-play and one-third color, just adding in a few of his details or a few of his thoughts, and mainly he's doing the play-by-play. -play. And for me, 
They're at their best when Semler's a third play-by-play, -play, a bit of it, the odd round, and then mainly analysis for him since he's focusing more on that, he's talking to the players more. So that's my ideal setup, and I think when that happens, I think they are the best in CSGO. I do think that Anders makes the game the most exciting. When there is a genuine moment and he's going off, I think that probably is the the, the, the best voice you want to hear for CSGO. <clears throat> and I think Samler does a really good job of when it's the big match and the big storyline and the big teams playing, he always focuses on how epic it is. And he brings out that aspect and he makes sure you know this isn't just another match. This isn't just seeing who's going to the final here. I think he does a really good job of that aspect. And as a result, I think that's how they fit together and, and the style works to create the best show and be the best showman. Now, DDK and Bardolf, obviously you've been massively on the rise the last year, year and so, half ago, but before they would, before that, they, yeah, they were obviously just mainly face it guys. I think DDK is very interesting in as much as he has those mad tangents that he will do where he just takes over a round doing it. And like, he's gotten better at it, but he used to just actually take over in the middle of a round and like stop casting and start doing these mad tangents. I mean, I always thought you could make a crazy drinking game where anytime anyone referenced chess, game theory, so poker plus EV plus expected value or whatever it is, the, the phrase, what can you do to lose right now? Just think about what can you do to lose right now? These are the things he would just mention a billion times. This is how he modeled the game. <clears throat> but it was unique and a bit wacky and, and sometimes had some interesting results. And I think for Bardolf, I think... Actually, I've, of the last year or so, I've noticed when there are really crazy sequences, so like the simple 1v2 on cash, funnily enough, another cash clip, the one where Nico got the deglaze. I do think in those moments when he goes super ham, he does have like a rawness to him that is actually quite cool. Like he does make those moments pretty epic. So I think he does a good job in that sense. Now, Henry, K Henry G and Sadakist are the other big casting duo. Now, Henry is really interesting because he used to be an ex-pro player and... In terms of his professional work, when he first started out, I thought initially he came off as a little bit boring because he was trying to be too professional. He was trying to be too much like that. So I think Sadek has brought him out of his shell a little bit and gave, made it a bit more like there's the party vibe and more jokes. Okay, I think that's something that Sadek has helped Henry with and he's better playing the straight man to those jokes anyway, so it works. But I think now... <clears throat> Instead of it being a little bit boring, now he's developed it. So it is still like a, a similar pacing, but now he's got a better rhythm. And so now once he gets into that rhythm, the way he keeps track of a game and what's going to happen here and how they played a scenario out last time, I think he's one of the best at doing that overall, keeping this fundamental track of the game going of how he thinks the ideal scenario we'd play, how they're playing before, what the what the goals are that they're going for now. I think he does a good job there. Funnily enough, it's a small detail, he is exactly off camera as he appears on camera. Now, admittedly, obviously, he makes more jokes off camera. It's not really his role within their duo, but that whole thing of like how he's like this stuck in the 90s and he only likes like 10 bands from the 80s and 90s, that's actually real. That's actually really his life. He's the sort of person who doesn't give a fuck about like movies and like uh, just actually is like, it's like he came in a time machine two years ago from like 20, from like 1999 and was like, oh, what's happening there, lads? <clears throat> Sadikist is someone who it's probably the rapidest rise I've ever seen in esports because the key re detail is he has insane natural talent. Now, I'm sure he's worked at it as well. He's done a lot of hours of the game, but <clears throat> I know in private he doesn't work at it in the same way that some of the fantastic casters that I also consider very talented in other games do. <clears throat> this is a guy who he has really good speed when he casts. His pacing's great. He rolls with the punches of things going wrong or saying something wrong. This never throws him off. People can, something crazy can happen in the game. Someone can say something. I think he's one of the best at instantly reacting to stuff in the game. I think he's got insane stamina as a caster. Like you've seen how many long, how many long days he can do and keep it, keep his level at the different, at whatever level it needs to be at throughout the day. Well, a key detail to that, okay, not a lot of people will know, is I won't tell you the circumstances, but this guy has been in scenarios where he's had like two hours sleep or where... He's been partying too much or he's just drunk way too much the night before during an event. I won't say which event, so you can imagine it was in the past. During an event, and yet he's the guy who can come in the next day and cast the first game, and you would never know as the person sitting in the crowd. Because when I'm watching it, I'm like, how the, how is that possible? And it's insane. I don't know how he does it, but he's the only one who I've ever seen who's never, his level of quality of work isn't affected by that. And so, yeah, you have to put it down to insane natural talent. Also, just as a final detail, he's someone I actually never thought would make it this far. Like when I first saw him at MLGX Games Aspen, when I first worked with him there, the problem was he was still too enmeshed in the NA scene. Like I remember when CLG beat 
uh, LDLC and Peter had the 20 orp frags and he and I remember him saying a line in that game which was something along the lines of like he needs to be the NA star and now he is or something and I remember just thinking like just rolling my eyes like come on mate isn't that like the first land game this guy's played and thinking is he going to be another one of these guys who just types NA all the time and tries luckily he's done all these global competitions he's lived in Europe a lot <clears throat> I think he's gotten completely out of that NA mindset and now he's he's just one of the best casters in the world and you don't think of the fact oh he's from NA and assume he's going to have biases because I don't think he does actually uh YNK, Yanko. I think Yanko has the best pure game analysis that we've ever seen in Counter-Strike, any version. I think the only person who can who can come close, and he does it in a slightly different manner because they're, they're so individualistic in their personalities, would be Lopez. And obviously, he isn't doing it very much recently. I think Yanko has the best pure game analysis. Like, if he looks at a game, breaking down what happened, what could happen, what they should have done differently what the overall meta game is and how that ties in. He's insane for that. And he has the most ridiculous memory for rounds that he's just watched in a live game you will ever see. It's unbelievable. I mean, in that sense, we actually had to make him slow down a bit and tell him, like, don't do so many rounds. Like, he, he, it's fantastic. You can remember it all. And these might all be great details to you. Kind of boil it down. Which were the really key ones? Get those out there and then create a bit more room so that the rest of the show flows. It doesn't just go into a black hole. I'd, I, I'd compare him in that sense to like Carmelo Anthony, the basketball player, okay? Because Carmelo Anthony, the basketball player, is an unbelievable one-on-one -on -one player. He's so good. But as a result, famously in his teams, he's gone a bit too far with that sometimes. And they always say, if you throw him the ball, it's like a black hole. You throw the ball in there, it's never coming back out again. Initially, Yanko had that issue, but he's gotten off that now. And now he integrates much better with the, the overall team in that sense. That's an area where me and him have really developed a partnership because as I wanted to do the pick band more and I saw how fantastic this guy is at the rounds, etc., I literally just told him, you know what, dude? I'm never going to try and do those rounds, basically. I'm to give them up to you you're going to do that it's going to be your thing i'm going to do the pick ban let's trade in that way i'll create room for you i'll do my analysis so it sets you up you do your analysis so that ties into what i'm saying if you can't do so and as a result i think we've developed one of the best synergies that you'll get of any of the analysts now moses the best thing to say about moses and he might get butt hurt by this i don't know is that he's basically an all-rounder like he can just do every single aspect of casting pretty well above average or a good level i don't think he's the best at, mo at nearly any of the areas I and mean, he hasn't done as many events as a lot of us but i think he's a really good all-rounder and as a result that's why he's really valuable to the desk because you can plug him into any of these scenarios and it'll make it go like if you lose a caster if you, someone needs a caster for a game if you need to give someone a break if you need him on the analysis desk if you need to do this on the analysis desk if you need him to take over as the expert he can do it all actually so in that sense he's very valuable actually he's very versatile also this might sound like a weird reason but i think he has one of the best laughs when he's on desks and so if there's going to be banter and jokes and humor i think it actually enhances it anytime he's laughing like that clip with bardolf where i was wrecking him on e-league that makes it more fun when he's just going ham also he is someone who will attempt some humor but but not completely out of bounds not outside of his realm of comfort <clears throat> i also think it's worth pointing out because a lot of people might not know this who didn't follow 1.6 he is one of the best former pros that of, of all the people on the desk as in when he was an actual pro player he was way better than like fifth laren was i know you're going to be up like fifth laren won championships up get real mate moses was actually a star player for his teams and was a very versatile player he was a really skilled player so he was the, he was the the only person who can match him in terms of ability in the game would actually be natu because at one point in time like you know like 13 years ago natu was actually really good and was like legit at one point in time maybe like a top 15 player in the world like he actually was a very skilled player at one point in time but beyond that moses is definitely number two after that probably lopez um sir scoots i actually think and i'll do, there's going to be a different video coming out where i'll go really in depth on this so i'll give you the overview for this i think sir scoots is the best host i have ever worked with and probably ever will and obviously listen i think me and richard get along very well machines start to build sensory memory, but the, the reason why is quite key which is this when you work with scoots he actually wants to know do you have some points or do you have something you want to say? If you give him that information, he'll use that to set you up better. He wants to throw to you any moment he thinks you've got something good. So if you start talking, he'll just stop talking and let you talk. Or if you interrupt him or if, or if he starts to just, you can do any of that stuff and he doesn't matter. He'll, he'll right, there we go, take the ball. He's the guy who makes you the star. So if you're the talent on the broadcast desk, he's setting you up to be the star to deliver your line, to do your job the best. And so to me, yeah, he's the guy who's willing to give up the ball all the time, but as a result, you win. So he's super good also at taking feedback. 
He's, like if you gave him some notes, oh, maybe we could do it in a diff- slightly different way. He'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll give that a try. And he's insanely professional on the actual desks themselves. Like no, like putting in hard work, preparing everything, trying to get all the sponsor things put in. He's really, really good at that. Might not be as smooth as like a machine or someone like that who have like, again, they have natural talent, etc. But this is a guy who's very hard working and does, I think does a fantastic job. And so I'm surprised that he's in some areas of the industry maligned or people don't think he's as good because I, I think he's the best. <clears throat> Fiflarun, we're talking about mainly as an analyst here. Now, what's funny is I think his biggest strength is he's the best ex-pro at giving you like a pro player's perspective of what he would be thinking or some inside detail on that pro player because he played in the CSGO scene and what, they, what they're like or what their perspective is. He's usually very good at that. And as a result, every now and then you'll get a nice little nugget, a little bit of insight that you didn't know from the player side of things about how a team might think. Early on, he could have been one of the best analysts because he he didn't he started working for Twitch and it's not his full time thing and he just does it on the off time. He's really stopped giving a fuck in some senses and hasn't kept up with lots of his homework. But as a result, he's gone more balls deep on the humor and the banter, and I think that actually is working very well. Like he's added a new dimension. He's got his own sense of humor in that sense, and it's always good back and forth. It can always do. He's never somebody who just gets butt hurt at a joke, etc. I think he's really good for that. So he's very fun to be around, and he's a good addition to an analyst desk like a me and Yanko. Now, Natu is a guy who was super old school. This guy literally was playing in 2001 for pro-level teams. He's, like I said, the best ex-player that we have as, a, as an analyst now in terms of as an actual player at the time. The key thing about Natu is he never tries to do more than he can. He never tries to pretend he's the smartest guy. He's got the most insight. In this what he does is he sticks to the fundamentals of how to play counter Like If you took the names off and you just looked at players and said, what did he do there? What could a player have done differently? He's the best at giving you the fundamentals like that. And he always layers it with an aspect of the mentality of the players and how they need to change their mentality or where it's at and what that's, what effect that's having on the game, which again is coming from an ex-player perspective. So I think he's an interesting all-rounder and like a, an interesting like niche addition in that sense who has his own little aspect of how he does it. The last name I'm going to say <coughs> is Machine, who obviously recently came along as a host because I mean Richard's off and then Scoots doesn't do every event in Europe and he obviously, obviously Machine does all the ESL events. I think he's a, a very good newcomer. Like he has the potential to be like the sadakist of hosting. Uh, but he is still figuring out the ropes. You do have to say that. He's a very good rookie, but he's still figuring out the ropes in some ways. Like for example, I think every now and then, he still doesn't always have the balance down on how to create the right amount of space for someone or when to pick the ball up back off them when they're not doing anything with it and not doing anything and then to throw it over. Now that's very tricky by the way because you have to learn all the personalities of the people you're working with. You have to learn a lot about casting. You have to learn how to slow down sometimes. Other times you have to learn how not to allow someone to go down a cold. It's a very tricky thing. It's not as easy as people think. That's why all the other people who are very good hosts have done it for years and years. So he's still figuring it out. <clears throat> with that said, I think he's a very fast learner. I think he adapts very well actually. Like he's someone who gets to know the the rhythm and the skill sets of the people he's working with so that then he can build the strengths around them. And also, ultimately, despite what I said earlier, does do a pretty good job, I've noticed, of trying to manage the time of, of who gets what so that it doesn't be the case, it's not the case that some guy at the end just never gets to speak in general. He does a pretty good job of that, which is something that a lot of hosts in esports actually can fuck up on and not do well. Now, in terms of the other names, you know, out there, Metis, Blue, Launders, etc., those guys are still finding their feet or they haven't done enough international events or I just haven't worked with them at actual events yet. So I can't really say a whole lot about them at the moment. And at the moment, I think the people I've listed above, that's the tier one and tier two ultimately. And in the future, let's see if we can have some other new names that join there or if the tiers switch around a bit. I mean, that wasn't obviously in direct list. Like I think Henry Seneca is better than Bardoff and DDK. But there's the that's what I think of most of the other casting talent.